to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the apostle paul said Fight the good fight of faith. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 12. Did you know that Christians are soldiers in the Lord's army? To find out more about this wonderful idea, we encourage you to stay tuned as we think about Soldiers of Christ Arise. Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at one 855 458-3905. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. One of the most powerful pictures of the church that is seen in Scripture is as the army of the Lord. Paul will say in Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 12, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. Right now, if we're a child of God, we are soldiers in the Lord's army. And God's plea is, as the old song says, for soldiers of Christ to arise and fight the good fight of faith. You know, as we think about the power of the gospel, as we think about living for Christ each and every day, we've got to realize we are in a militant, aggressive battle every day against Satan and the host of wickedness. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5 says, We don't wrestle against, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Rather, we fight against Satan and the spiritual host of wickedness, striving to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And friend, as we think today about soldiers of Christ arising to the call and the challenge in the Lord's army, let's realize that the kingdom of Christ and really the battle of Christ is not of this world and God's soldiers here are not involved in a temporary physical battle. Rather, we're in a spiritual battle. John 18, verse 36, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my, soul, my servants would fight. The kingdom of Christ is a spiritual rule and reign. And therefore, we're involved in a spiritual battle against wickedness. This is why we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, as 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 says. This is why Jesus encouraged us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And thus, we're involved in the most important battle one could ever imagine, the battle against Satan for souls. 1 Peter 5, verse 8, the scripture clearly says, Be sober, 
to be vigilant for your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking those whom he may devour. And so today we want to think about what does the scripture teach us about being in the army of the Lord and what is my responsibility in the Lord's army? You know, when we think about the nature, what is it like in the Lord's army? Let's realize that this is a volunteer army. Nobody's going to force you to fight. Nobody's going to make you fight. Nobody's going to draft you or make you enlist in the Lord's army. It is strictly a volunteer army. Do you remember Psalm 110, verse number 3? The psalmist says, In the day of your power, they will be volunteers. Volunteers is what God's looking for, not force people, but those who willingly want to come. This is why Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden. Nobody's making them, nobody's forcing them, but people freely come to Christ and volunteer for His cause. Revelation 22, 17, Let whosoever will come is the cry of the groom in Revelation chapter 22. The Bible teaches us that when we realize all that God has done for us, when we realize just how much Jesus sacrificed, we have the ability to choose to serve God. This is why Joshua would say in Joshua 24 verse 15, choose for yourselves this day whom you'll serve. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. The choice is ours to make. But when we realize the only other option is to choose a life of sin, Friends, it's a very simple choice. Romans 6, 17, Paul would say, God be thanked that though you were the slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. You know, the good news and the encouraging idea here is that in the Lord's army as volunteers, those who really do volunteer to serve the Lord are that much more committed. What about somebody who lists in the army today? Let's say you had people who enlisted and people who were drafted into the army. Which of those two do you think really want to be there? Well, naturally the ones who chose to be there. The same idea is true in the kingdom of Christ. Those who choose to be there, those who make that choice, are the ones who are going to work diligently in fighting the good fight of faith. I'll give you an example. During the time of uh, the judges and Joshua, you've got the example of Gideon. And here Gideon, in the context of Joshua 6 and 7, he reduced God's forces basically from 32,000 to 300 volunteers. Anybody who's faint-hearted, Joshua said, go home. Those who can't do it right, they had a test, litmus test for that, they were sent home, down from 32,000 to 300 volunteers, those who wanted to be there or the ones who fought and overcame in the battle. And friend, the same is true for us. If we're going to fight the good fight of faith, I've got to go into it knowing. I'm here because I want to be here. I'm here to serve God. I'm here to fight the good fight of faith, and I want to do what I can in this great volunteer army for the greatest cause in the world. What else is the nature of the Lord's army like? What's it like in the Lord's army? The Lord's army has a perfect captain and commander. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10, as captain of the Lord's army, Jesus has gone before us and blazed the way or set the pattern to follow. He was tempted at all points as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4 verse 15, we have that perfect commander who knows how to defeat the devil and who has set the path before us. You know, when we think about Jesus, he was not only tempted in all points as we are without sin, yet the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, verses 21 and 22, He committed no sin, nor was guile or deceit found in His mouth. And thus Peter would say, we're to follow in His footsteps. That's the, the perfect path that Jesus went down. I know exactly how to fight. I know exactly the plan. I know the perfect uh, position for defeat if I follow the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, when we think about Jesus, the writer Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 21, that God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, that we might be made the righteousness of God in or through Him. I'm devoted to following Christ out of love for what He's done for me and you. John 3, 16 puts it this way so beautifully. God so loved the world, 
He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Why do we follow Christ? Why are we motivated to get in line behind the perfect commander? While we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's why, because when man was at his lowest, in my life and yours, when, when we needed God's mercy and grace and help to overcome sin, Jesus lovingly made that path available to each one of us. And thus, out of that motivation, commitment comes. Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Be faithful until death, Jesus said, and I'll give you the crown of life. I know full well that if I follow Christ, if I get in line behind Him as the perfect commander, if I'm faithful to death, and if I stay committed, I absolutely will be victorious in the greatest battle ever. It was the great General Napoleon who said this. He said to his people, he said, we rested the creation of our genius on force. Of Jesus, he said, this man has built an empire on love. And at this moment, he said, millions would die for him. Christ has never forced anybody. He's never made anybody. Every person who wants to follow Christ faithfully does it out of love. And friend, that's the perfect commander, the best you could ever begin to imagine as it relates to giving ourselves to Almighty God and the things that He wants us to do in this life. As we think about the nature of the Lord's army, let's also realize that the one weapon we use is the sword of the Spirit. Ephesians 6 verse 17, and taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. In this battle against evil, battle against sin, battle to overcome Satan, what weapon do I have? I have the most powerful, able weapon you could ever imagine. Romans 1 16 says, the gospel is God's power to save. We're not fighting with man-made weapons, military might, with jets or tanks or machine guns. We're fighting with the sword of the Spirit, which the Bible tells us is the Almighty Word of God. And friend, this is the most powerful weapon you could ever have. Listen to Hebrews 4 verse 12. The Word of God is living and powerful sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. As I fight against Satan, I can overcome him because God's Word I can hide in my heart that I might not sin against him. Psalm 119, the Bible says, if we receive with meekness the implanted Word, it's able to save our souls. James 1, verse number 21, and we fight that good fight of faith with the Word of God armed in our hearts and minds so that we can live faithfully to Him. And here's what's amazing about the Word of God. Not only does the Word of God have the power to defeat Satan, we know it does. For in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, as Jesus was tempted by Satan to defend Himself every time Jesus appealed to the Scripture and said, It is written, it is written, it is written. And so it has the ability and the power to overcome Satan. But you know, the Word of God has the ability and power to help keep me like I ought to be, to help keep me living as I ought to live. This is why the psalmist said, God's Word is hidden in our heart that we might not sin against Him. You know, as we think about the nature of the Lord's army, let's also realize this fact. There are no paid leaves in the Lord's army. You know, you might be in the army today and you might get a paid leave. You might get a month or six week vacation paid leave and get to go visit your family and just be off for a while. Friend, let's realize that the Lord's army is a continual everyday fight. And when I do take that leave, you can rest assured Satan has me right where he wants me. The Bible says in Acts 2 verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. This is why Paul would say, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. This is why we're taught to search the scriptures daily, Acts 17 verse 11. This is why we 
pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 17 following. And this is why we realize that the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil. God knows and God sees. He wants me to be active. He wants me to be working. He doesn't want me to get lazy. In fact, the times you find in the Bible where laziness occurs, people's souls were in jeopardy. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 clearly teaches that idea. And so let's realize this is an everyday battle in the Lord's army to overcome self, to overcome sin, and to overcome Satan. But you know, as we think about the nature of this army, and we've mentioned it multiple times already, but just to drive the point home, let's realize this army has the most dangerous enemy you could ever imagine. You think of dangerous enemies that have existed throughout world wars, and you think of people like, like Hitler. You think of people like maybe Saddam Hussein or Osama bin Laden. You think about great evil men who have done great acts of atrocity upon mankind. And friend, I will promise you, they don't begin to compare with the evil, heinous things Satan has done in the garden. He tempted Adam and Eve, and sin became of a, a, a death, and sin began to reign in each person because of sin from that time. He's the one who tempted Jesus. He's the one who tempted Peter and Judas and, and all the havoc. Think about Job. Here's Job. He was upright and blameless man, and Satan's been going back and forth on the earth, and God says, have you considered my servant Job? And from that point, Satan begins to wreak havoc in the life of Job doing everything possible to get him to curse God and die. Friend, that's the type of enemy that we're fighting against today. Described like a roaring lion in 1 Peter 5 verse 8. Described as a, a, a sly conniving servant, serpent in Revelation 12 and in Genesis chapter 3. Like a dragon in Revelation 12. Just an evil, ungodly, immoral, murderer and liar from the beginning, John chapter 8, verses 40 through 44. And thus, if Satan is that type of enemy, then friend, I assure you, we need every ounce of uh, uh, fight that we can muster. We need the uh, help of God and the encouragement of the Scripture to overcome this wicked enemy. But you know, as we think about that fight, let's think about the nature of not only the army itself, but let's think about what does the scripture describe as the nature of a good fighter or a good soldier in the Lord's army. Friend, that person must be well managed. That person must be in shape. He must be spiritually active and he must have his faculties ready to serve in the Lord's army. Second Corinthians chapter five, Verse number 17 tells us, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all has become new. He must approach this fight with newness of life. Romans 6 verse 4, putting the old past behind him and under the guidance and lordship of our Savior Jesus Christ. We must realize this Jesus, whom has been crucified, is Lord and Christ. Acts chapter 2, verse number 36. He is one who must train fervently in the Lord's army. When you think about Hebrews chapter 12, the Bible says in Hebrews 12, beginning in verse 1, Seeing then that we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily ensnare us. And listen to this, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What's that? good servant like, that good soldier like, he must run the race with endurance. He's got to train. He's got to give it his all. He's got to catch his second win, we might say, and, and keep running that race. Paul looked at it this way. In 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27, Paul said, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I've preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. Did Paul have to train himself? Did he have to work diligently? Did he have to fight the things off that often tried to come up in his life? And, and did he have to strive every day to win the battle? 
You bet He did. Christians must train every day. Prayer, Bible study, doing the work of God, encouraging one another, those are all, one another. Those are all things that are so important in fighting the good fight of faith. But you know, one of the things that we also must do is build endurance as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3 verse 18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And isn't enough just to say, well, I've reached this point in my life as a Christian. I've got to always be taking a step forward, always be striving to win the battle, and always be striving to build up my endurance as a Christian. For I will promise you, every time that we may defeat Satan, there is a plan in action, there's a plan in his mind of another even greater way he thinks to overcome us. And so our endurance must ever be increasing as a child of God. The great fighter Jack Dempsey said this. He said, a champion is someone who gets up when he can't. When you don't feel like you can anymore. When you feel like you're ready to throw in the towel. What separates those who are faithful to God from those who aren't? You pick yourself up and you keep going. Be faithful until death. Revelation chapter 2 verse number 10. And then as we think about what's it like to be a good fighter in the Lord's army, a good fighter always has a developed offense. That is, we're on the offense. We're looking to overcome Satan at all times. You know, when I think about fighting the good fight of faith, Paul will say in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I'm kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. Paul knew he had fought the fight. He knew he'd kept the faith. And friend, when we live faithful God and we're striving to, we're not on the defense, we're on the offense. That is, we're looking, what good can I do? How can I grow today? Not what's Satan going to throw at me, but what can I do to strive to live faithful to God every day? You know, as we think about this idea of faithfulness and really having an offense, striving every day to live faithful to the Lord, I'm reminded of something else that a great fighter once said by the name of Muhammad Ali. All of us are familiar with Muhammad Ali. Here's what he said. Upon his offense, he said this. This was his strategy. He said, I'll be in fighting one of the great fighters of his day. He said, I'll beat him so bad, he'll need a shoehorn to put his hat on. Now, you know, when you think about having an offense, that was his mindset. He said, I'm going to go into this fight thinking that man's going to need somewhere else to hang his hat when I'm through with him. That's the mindset Christians want to have in the battle against Satan, in the battle against evil. I don't want to be always on the defense. I want to go into it knowing I'm in a fight. I want to go into it knowing Satan's going to tempt me, and I want to go into it with a plan to overcome the temptations that Satan may throw at each and every one of us every day. And then as we think about the nature of a good soldier, a good soldier is someone who must strengthen his efforts, must strengthen his defense, and must be prepared to do that battle. 1 Peter 5 verse 8 again says, Be sober, be vigilant, always on guard, always watchful, always looking out for the temptations of Satan. You know, this happened to Peter, and it was sad that Peter was not ready. In Luke chapter 22 verse 31, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan desires to have you that he may sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you. I will assure you that our name can be placed where Simon's name is. My name can be put there and yours as well, and you can rest assured Satan desires to have you. This is why we must ever be strengthening in the Word of God, in our work of the church, and in our lives as Christians so that we can overcome Satan and all that he throws at us. But you know, as a good soldier, we also need to never underestimate the opponent. We don't want to ever get to a point where we say, you know, Satan, he's not that bad. I can overcome him. He's not that difficult to defeat. You read Matthew chapter 4 again. 
Jesus was tempted in every way possible, and only by His strength in the Word of God was He able to overcome. Luke chapter 4, when, the, uh, when that woman's house is cleaned out of all the evil servants, the Bible says that they did leave, but they left until a more opportune time arose. Friend, you can rest assured Satan's going to do his part. Job 1 presents him as an active, aggressive, and militant evil enemy. And we need to realize, don't ever underestimate what Satan can do and the things that he can do against us in this life. And so the nature of a good soldier is one who must never give up and one who must never give in in fighting this great battle. But friend, because of all that God has done for us, we need to be motivated every day to serve him in this army. 2 Corinthians 5 the Apostle Paul said the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he who died for all died for them that those who live for him should not die again but live for Christ each and every day so that we can be faithful unto the Lord and remain true to his gospel. Don't give up in fighting the good fight of faith. Stay true in the greatest cause ever. I'm reminded of the words of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Verse number 9, the Bible says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that we through His poverty might be made rich. Look at what Jesus did in each one of our lives. He gave up the beauty and the splendor of that place called heaven so that one day, leave it coming to this earth, dying on the cross, so that one day we could live in heaven with Him for eternity. Friend, are you in the Lord's army today? Have you obeyed the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? If not, we beg you today, leave a life of sin and come to Jesus in obedience to the gospel. Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God and Savior of the world? John chapter 8, verse 24. Would you be willing to turn from a life of sin and selfishness? Luke chapter 13, verse number 3. Would you confess the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life? Romans 10, verse 10. And would you, to have every sin washed away, be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Acts chapter 2, verse number 38. And if as a child of God, you know that in the Lord's armor, your life's not been lived like it should. Friend, there's always time to come home, to get your life right, and to stay faithful to God. May each of us strive to really be the soldiers God wants us to be. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.